This is Nursing 622, Module 14. We're talking about cognitive and perceptual disorders. The learning objectives is to identify those psychological disorders in the pediatric population, the timing of the screening, as well as treatment and prognosis. When we look at problems that are acquired or processing using information, we look at the cognitive perceptual disorders, especially in children. This talks about memory, encoding, storing, retrieving information, the competence by creating or manipulating those mental Im images, and then their attention, their focus, their shift of focus, and how they're able to be able to regurgitate the information that's given to them and really absorb it. The processing speed where it links all three of these together as well as the cognition and knowledge with the accumulation and reorganization of experiences. We also look at perception. Remember we've talked about self-perception in the past. This is the organization and interpretation of the sensory information that is given to them. We look at standards of care again, Healthy People 2020. There has been concern due to disparities of health. We look at those vision and hearing screenings. We look at the school readiness for children, the educational achievement, screening for autism, and other developmental delays. Again, Bright Futures is the early identification and intervention for problems with any cognitive help. These are all screening tools that are standards of care. So when we look at this cognitive perceptual development, we look at Piaget. A simulation is how you take in the information, then accommodation is just how you modify the current ability, how you understand new, circumstance, new circumstances, then the schema, organizing into a new mental structure, and then their equilibrium of the cognition, that new level of con cognition and perception that aids in development. So we look at information processing theories. <clears throat> The intellectual capabilities, the structural components, sensory, these visual, auditory, registers, cues, short-term memory, long-term memory, the process components that looks at rehearsal activities, any working memories, automatic processing, those tasks, that structure, that context that has to do with processing different information. We look at the social cognition, the intuition, the ability to interpret behaviors, emotions, what do these kids feel about this? Are they able to interpret the behavior and emotion? Can they process this? We look at their ability by understanding thoughts, following rules of social play, regulating the responses to different social environments. We look at their perception and how they're gonna anticipate how others feel, how they can communicate, comprehend in the social environment understanding body language, perceive faces, and note those nonverbal cues. There is a spectrum of development skills for each age group. We see this with executive functions, prefrontal cortex, self-regulation. So terms to know, inhibition, this is the stop delay, it's your first response. Interruption of inappropriate behavior. Resistance of interference by distractions. Am I able to manipulate around and be able to, in essence, tone that out? And then looking at the flexibility. Can you shift between activities and thoughts? We might call it multitasking as adults, but as children, that flexibility for them to be able to shift. When we look at co components of the metacognition, we look at their working memory. We look at the verbal, the nonverbal. What do you remember? What do you remember what was said? Or facial expressions, or how they were standing. We look at problem solving, how they monitor tasks, or how they monitor themselves. We look at that sensory processing, the integration of the information from senses, taste, touch, feel, smell, what they see. Sensory modulation, that regulation of responses. You see it a lot with autistic kids. There's a sensory component. They don't do very well with high sensory situations. Then there's a sensory discrimination, which is that interpretation of the stimuli. And when you have these cognitive perceptual development delays, this can lead to a decrease in the discrimination, decrease in that sensory base motor or the balance or core stability for these children. 
We look at the social and emotional skills that will lead to academic success. We look at self-control. Can they manage their emotions, their behavior, and be able to focus? They, can they inhibit those negative responses that you want to have? Delay that gratification of wanting that positive, positive, positive right away. The persistence, the continuing in the goal in spite of obstacles and difficulty, will they pursue on? Will they see that bigger picture? The mastery orientation, that desire to increase their competency. Instead of just performing a task, do they know about the outcome? Do they see the long term? And again, this varies with age. But as we start at the younger generation, we build on this. Looking at the academic self-efficacy, looking at one's own actions, how it influences outcomes, what is, in it, what is the outcome going to be? What will happen if I do X, Y, and Z? That social competency, knowing that skills you possess and how you interact with others is ultimately going to be integral as you pursue further careers and your development. So as we look at these normal patterns of cognitive perceptual development, we look at intelligence, the ability to learn, understand, deal with new situations, look at the learning, observations, accommodations, how they're able to adapt. Look at that language, that memory, that attention. You can see this in their, your primary care visits. Are they able to dialogue with you? Are they able to carry on a conversation? And are you able to hold their attention span? Do they learn from what you tell them? We look at language, their listening, their reading, their comprehension. We see this in their report cards. This is why it's important to say, hey, bring your report cards to your primary care visit. Let's see how they're doing. Their oral, their written expression, short-term memory, how they're working actively with new things that happen in school and socially. Consolidation of those long-term memory about things they've learned in the past and are they able to retrieve that and be able to adapt and utilize it towards future problems, crises, positive outcomes <clears throat> and learning. Looking at the attention, what is the concentration? If they have distractions, are they able still to maintain that attention span? Can they shift their focus when it's required and be able to adapt to the situation not only socially, but also interpersonally. When we look at individual characteristics, we look at that cognition, the predictor of success, those developmental skills that contribute to the intelligence, their resilience. Do they have that motivation to succeed? Or are they looking at the task at hand, that's it, we need the end goal, and that's it, end of story. Do they have that desire for education? Do they want to learn? Do they know how important it is as a child what that education and learning is going to help them in the future. We also have to take into account those family characteristics, that community acceptance of family structure. What is their role in the family? Different ethnic and cultural backgrounds have different roles. Education might not be as readily acceptable in some cultures because there is an expectation to provide for the family regardless if you're educated or not looking at those family values, performance expectations, and then parental academic abilities. Do you have parents who can even stay on the same level as these children as they age with their academics? Primary care strategies look at that family-centered medical home for any child. When you're looking at these cognitive perceptual problems, we need to know that full circle, there is that support system, that the family is involved and everybody is on board for success. Identifying, mobilizing the child's strengths. If we have some negatives, we talk about the negatives, but we always end on a positive note. We look at that positive reinforcement, we continue to push through with that positivity, and that's how we get a better outcome with these children. We look at educational strategies. You hear about early intervention programs. This is why we have screening tools in school. Let's identify issues and problems ahead of time so we can spearhead it so they are not fighting an uphill battle all the way through childhood, through adolescence, preteen, and then into adulthood. Individualized, 
individual education plans. This is important because every child's different, just like every patient is different. We need to maintain that strength-based approach. This means we look at what they're good at, what they have been able to hone in on and have been able to acclimate themselves to and they are proficient in. And we utilize those strengths to be able to bring those negatives to help them succeed. When we look at family support strategies, we look at the advocacy, conferencing, monitoring. Is the family involved? Are the parents involved? Do they have a support system? What is their rights, entitlements to have this extra help? What community resources are available? Looking at the social and adaptive strategies, how can we make them be as independent as possible but still try to give them that extra help that maybe some other children don't need but maximize the independence that they do have. Social skills, learning, build on what they have and what they know. Utilize that structure, utilize those experiences that they have. Interprofessional collaboration, everybody needs to be on board. Your teachers, your counselors, your primary care physician, your parents, your family, everybody needs to come together and integrate these services and understand what the end goal is what the positivity is going to be for that patient if everybody is supportive while we bring those negative perceptual development issues into the mix and continue to push that child forward attention deficit hyperactivity disorder adhd is a very significant problem we see it a lot with our younger population even more now than it used to be in adolescents a lot of it is secondary to primary play where they're just watching video games or on tablets, things like that. This is a neurological basis chronic condition. It, is have, it does have some hereditary link to it. It's a cognitive, educational, behavioral, emotional, social, all aspects of that child. We have found that some children with the ADHD, just like autism, have significant intelligence. How do we bring that out? Core symptoms of ADHD, inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity. When something's going on in the classroom, they are not able to redirect. Immediately, their focus is gone. We have to sit down and say, okay, let's focus. What is our task at hand? And then we have to give them that positive reinforcement to know what they are focusing on. And when they accomplish that task, this is the benefit of it. Clear impairment in social, academic, occupational functioning is noted with ADHD. You can look at the criteria for the different subtypes. Self-regulation and executive functions are noted here. They're not able sometimes to even perform the simple tasks you would expect from a child two to three years younger. Why? They cannot focus at the task at hand. If it requires intense focus, even for minutes, they don't want to be bothered with it. Six functions impaired by ADHD. We look at the activation, which is the organizing, prioritizing, starting, just getting moving, getting going. That focus, that sustaining, shifting attention to the task at hand and pursuing on despite any outliers or any variables that may come in. The effort, regulating, sustaining, processing what is going on at that time, looking at the moment, looking at the emotions, how are they able to manage that frustration when it does occur if they can't figure something out? We look at their memory, their recall. How do we find ways to help them with their memory? What works for them? Does pacing around the house and coming up with mnemonics work for them? Does taking a walk and doing it? Can we link it to a TV program they like or a show? How do we make that work so they can associate that memory and that recall? And then action, monitoring self-regulation. A lot of that has to do with how do they respond to the environment and the task at hand. Prevalence has been rising. <clears throat> We've noticed ADHD diagnosed earlier and earlier. Now the average age is seven years old. 
There is that racial ethnic disparity. Again, that is with your Healthy People 2020 with the disparities of health, low socioeconomic status, and again, genetics. We can't change that, right? That's non-modifiable. Hispanics and African Americans are less likely to be diagnosed. Why? Is there a stigma within their culture? Well, that can't be you. Suck it up. You, you can do this. You're supposed to be a man. You're supposed to be a woman. You're supposed to be able to manage this. You have to look at that cultural and ethnic background so you understand some of these cross-cultural considerations when it comes to ADHD. So we look at the prevalence. It has been increasing, like I said. We know there's those disparities of health that we see in Healthy 2020 and understanding that there are other cross-cultural considerations like I just said. Environmental factors, we look at the interaction of genes, environment. Is there a family history? Is there anything else going on? Is there potential leaks to smoking, alcohol use, prematurity, psychosocial stressors, possible lead exposure? Is there a metabolic reason for these issues? Lead exposure, maternal depression, childhood experiences, trauma, society changes. Has their structure been disrupted at all? Clinical findings we see is difficult with attention, activity, impulsivity, and we can see that even in our primary care visits. We can see that they're not even able to focus with us during our interactions. That memory and emotion, the organizational difficulties, social issues with friends, behaviors, lashing out behaviors because of frustration, and then watching that interaction between the parent and the child. We have ADHD standardized assessment scales. You can look at these and look at the history and physical and how important it is to look at that comprehensive history. You could see it in the past. Remember, there was a stigma attached to this, maybe when their parents were younger and they weren't officially diagnosed. We need to do that complete physical exam. We need to rule out any physical problem that could be contributing to these factors. <clears throat> ADHD standard assessment scales show that adults from at least two domains, school, home, daycare, have noticed that they meet this criteria. Normally it is done at the school and then they are further sent to a specialist. This provides insight into variations during the day, monitor any response to therapy if you do implement therapy. And then there's those other tools that you can look at. We look at differential diagnosis. Do they have a sleep disorder, a learning disorder, emotional behavioral disorders, depression, anxiety, OCD? Is there a transgender component and they're not able to cope with it when they're at school and can't focus because they were born a boy and they identify more with a female and that's all they focus on and think of. These are things that we have to think about and come into play when we're looking at working them up for any type of psych psychosocial disorder, especially with ADHD and those behavioral diagnosis. Management, we look at the onset, the duration, the setting of the impairment, the nature and degree, reviewing the school records, seeing how things are in different environments, effects on relationships. How is their inattentiveness, hyperactivity, impulsivity? What do the teachers describe them as? Have they had screenings done? What is that finding shown? The initial meeting with the family and child, you see a comprehensive discussion of findings, and then you look at the bigger picture. You identify those difficulties, those vulnerabilities, those factors that jump out to you, say, hey, maybe there's something going on here. You have the psychoeducation, and you educate the patient and the families. We don't want that stigma attached. If there's something we could do to help them out, we need to make sure everybody is on board and they have that support system. We know focus is a difficult thing. We know that short-term goals work better with positive reinforcement. So making a short-term plan with target goals is gonna give you that more immediate positive reinforcement with these children. You do the medical home, so that way we know there's follow-up. 
The plan of care is going to include any pharmacological management, behavioral management, support services, counseling, anything that's involved with helping come full circle in making this child be successful. Pharmacological management, we look at stimulants. These are your first line medications. We look at amphetamines like your Adderalls. This blocks the removal of dopamine, norepinephrine. They can be extended release. They can be short acting. There can be a combination of the two. Some take extended release in the morning and then need a short acting dose in the afternoon to be able to finish out their day. We try to start as low as possible to get the greatest effect. We try to avoid long acting. So there's a decrease in the need for that stigma. I have to go to the nurse to get my meds. Sometimes it is indicated. However, sometimes we can work around it. Begin at a low dose, titrate every one to three weeks, talk with the parents, understand that there could be some side effects. You know, you need to monitor their height, their weight, what's their appetite like. And then now we have Vyvanse, which is a spinoff of Adderall without a lot of those side effects. Adderall was causing a lot of headaches, a lot of fatigue, even though it was a stimulant medication. Vyvanse has kind of tweaked that, where you still get the added benefit with the stimulant to help them focus without all of those side effects. Stimulant warnings, of course, cardiac you ask them at every visit if you are doing their follow-up after their, they've been diagnosed or their initial screening. Any funny feelings in your heart? Is the heart rate up? Is their weight down? Are they eating at all? Is their height where it should be? Are they following their growth pattern that they were doing prior to implementing these medications? We look at the non-stimulant medication. These are first line in children greater than six. These are your norepi reuptake inhibitors. But remember, we need to make sure that we have a baseline lab. How is their liver functions? Is there any family history? And again, talking to them, how do you feel about yourself? Do you wanna hurt yourself? Do you wanna hurt others? Is there any concern? And if they have any type of congenital cardiac abnormality, as a primary care physician, you should not be implementing this medication. Second line adjunct, you can have the extended release medications. Again, these are in conjunction with a therapy that has been in place that has had some help, but you might need that little extra to get them over the hump to help them succeed. There is some effectiveness with behavioral management, counseling. There's a lot of resources in the community with behavioral activities parent skills management to help them be able to set up a structure with the patients and have goal-driven activities. We look at that cognitive behavioral therapy, that psychoeducation, skills to modify the behavior, classroom management. How do these teachers improve the intention and productivity, decrease disruption, but also not make it seem like these children are getting special treatment? We look at adaptive technology. Oftentimes with ADHD, they do very well with computer screens, with, <clears throat> excuse me, that technology. Whereas we wanna limit it, but how can we make it benefit us for the time they are utilizing it? Peer interventions, neurofeedback. How are they doing? How are we seeing with their cognitive function after our intervention? Support and services are always important, that follow-up care like we talked about, monitoring, education, prevention. And again, know what you don't know. Refer them out and get the screening tools, get the help they need. Learning disorders and neurodevelopmental dysfunction consists of reading, writing, listening, speaking, reasoning, those math and social skills. Um, DSM-5 has learning disabilities with different specifiers for the deficit based on where the difficulty lies. You can have learning disorders, look at the risk factors, look at the family history. This is why we have screening tools and they go through this when they go into kindergarten and first grade and throughout their academia. Look at differential diagnosis. Is there a behavioral mental health disorder that is undiagnosed that we're thinking maybe is neurodevelopmental. 
Do they have anxiety? Is there a family history of anxiety? Do they have social anxiety? Is there cognitive limitations? Were there issues in vitro? Was there any history of fetal alcohol syndrome or any neural tube defects or anything else that can contribute to this? Any post-traumatic episodes the child might be reliving? Was there a trauma? Was there a loss of a family member? Was there bullying? Getting a good history is gonna give you good indicators and help you with these children. Monitoring these patients, referrals out to the support systems that are available. We look at the educational and adaptive supports, the plans for the schools that they have, the family and social support, but again, these all start with the screening, and then we move on from there. Constant monitoring, looking at complications secondary to the plan in place, medications in place, and why are they acting out? If they're having issues at school, has something else happened, or do we need to come back to the drawing board and revise the plan we have in place? We look at sensory processing disorders. This is the inaccurate and imprecise detection of sensory input. We look at motor clumsiness, the behavioral problems over or under responsiveness, sensory issues, postural. These are things that we need to identify early on, which is why you have your well child visits. The relationship between behaviors and sensory experience is directly correlated. There can also be developmental cognitive delays on top of this, such as your ADHD or your ASD. And early diagnosis, referral, and treatment is key. You can notice that there's a lack of friends, poor self-concept. We talk about self-perception and how they see themselves and academic failure. How do we create those short-term goals to help them be successful? Autism has been more prevalent because it's been studied more. We have those neurologic, neurobiological and neurodevelopment disorder. Again, this is a testing and screening tool all on its own. There's two different diagnostic domains. You can have the social communication interactive, or you can have the restrictive repetitive patterns of behavior. Some of these children do not talk much. However, they are brilliant. Their IQ is through the roof. We look at the restrictive repetitive patterns. Why are they doing it? Is that the one thing that they have control of? You look at symptoms from early childhood and you try to start your intervention then because you don't want that lifelong disability. You wanna help them be successful. The cause is ultimately unknown. It occurs in all different racial, socioeconomic groups. There's a possibility there's a genetic component immune system dysfunction, we really don't have significant data to back this. Things we look for in the clinical findings is the social interactions, their abnormal responses, especially to sensory. Sensory stimuli seems to be a big component with autism, regardless of what stage they're at. <clears throat> Infants, toddlers, preschooler, school age, adolescents, they all have different ranges with how they present with autism and on the spectrum. We look at developmental surveillance. We look at the screening tools. And again, referral early as possible is needed. Looking at possible social or language disorders, and it could be a combination of the two, but knowing there could be a differential diagnosis is very vital for these children. Management with resources and support with special health care needs, behavioral mental health and education, early intervention. Everything with these children with psychosocial is early intervention, as early as possible to get them the help they need. We have medications to help treat co-occurring conditions, meaning are they autistic and have a component of ADHD with it? How can we manipulate the medication that we can take care of the ADHD component and in essence fit it into the plan with their autism? There is not strong data for efficacy, but we can start with that plan with the screening tools we have and the specialists that we've talked to and monitor how they're doing and seeing if we are meeting those short-term goals. Complementary alternative therapies. And again, family counseling and support with these children are huge. It's not just the child, it's the family, it's the whole component. And understanding that and knowing the dynamics of the family is crucial. 
your references with your textbook readings and additional resources.